Are you an executive making a video pitch to win new business? Perhaps you're a team leader producing an internal video to motivate your staff. Or you might be an advertising firm creating a public relations campaign to convince people that oil companies care about climate change. Well, whatever it is, corporate music has you covered. Because no matter the product, no matter the event, it has the ability to touch each and every one of us. When we learn, when we play, and even when we turn off, it has the power to inspire joy and sometimes heartache. It can fill us with wonder and bring us back down to earth. And whatever journey you're on, it holds your hand all the way, helping you ideate and innovate to achieve above and beyond forever. Okay, I'm sorry for doing that. Oh, sorry. Let's just take a moment. Let's breathe. Okay, okay. Here we go. Corporate music. Why does it exist? No matter how much of it I'm exposed to, I always seem to come away feeling either baffled or irritated. When it's trying to be inspirational, it only really succeeds in making me feel sort of tired and jaded. If it tries to come across as emotionally charged or poignant, it ends up sickly sweet and desperate. And I don't think I'm alone here. Most people I know seem to feel the same way, which makes corporate music a unique phenomenon when you think about it. A genre that manages to thrive despite being both unpopular and ineffective. And I've not witnessed anyone jumping in to defend it either. I mean, usually when you criticize a style of music, you'd worry that you might hurt some people's feelings. Corporations are people, my friend. Oh, oh yeah, I, I forgot about that. Um, yeah, yeah thanks, Smith. So what do I mean by corporate music? Well, it's not exactly straightforward to define. I want to first be clear that I'm not talking about commercialism, which is when artists allow financial interests to infect their music. My new Sony phone is ringing. Corporate music is different in that it's transparently created to be a backing track that helps someone sell something. I say we go all in on the internet of things. It's mainly used in that weird world where businesses advertise themselves to other businesses, or in videos created by massive corporations to communicate with their thousands of employees. Let's deal with this side first, the insular business side, before talking about how it can spill out into the real world. So, corporate music isn't exactly a genre in the traditional sense because it's not bound to a specific style or set of instruments. I think it's more accurately described as something that can harness the trappings of a style, taking its surface level idioms and cliches, while deliberately leaving behind any emotional authenticity. In other words, I think corporate music is something designed not to resonate with us emotionally. And I want to clarify what I mean by this before we dig into some examples. So, let me share a story. A few years ago, I was working as a designer in a really horrible corporate studio in London. And one morning, on my way to this studio, my train malfunctioned and I found myself stranded at Tottenham Hale Station, which, for anyone who doesn't know London well, is a pretty joyless place. So to pass the time, I grabbed a book I was reading called Dialectic of Enlightenment by Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer, written in 1944. In essence, it's a critique of how our thinking has been affected under late capitalism. One of its observations is that modern society is nowhere near as enlightened as it thinks it is, and that the most rational among us are still trapped in systems of thinking that are magical in nature. And they're talking about actual magic here. One of the examples they point to is the ancient practice of human sacrifice, a transaction that offers a human life in return for divine favour. Adorno and Horkheimer compared this with the thinking process of a modern worker caught up in the machinery of capitalism being forced to work for an employer with no real financially plausible alternative. They felt that, along with this physical obligation to be at work, workers were also forced to actively practice what they called the introversion of sacrifice. And so, hold on, let me read that again. The introversion of sacrifice? What? What on earth could that mean? Well, I didn't know. I just stood there, stranded in Tottenham Hale Station, trying to comprehend what this could mean in concrete terms. Did they mean that we simply sacrifice our time in return for money? That felt a little obvious and I felt I was missing the point. So after about 20 minutes, I put the book away and just stared out into space at all the tired and irritated looking people around me and the generally ugly atmosphere with all its electric wiring and massive billboards. My overwhelming feeling at that moment was, oh man, 
I really wish I could just exit this dump and go home. And then I looked up at the billboards and focused on one that was advertising a fashion line promising to help you look snappy at the office. And it was at this moment that I started to think of the ways that I was trapped. Not just in location, but also in spirit. Like, why would I want to look snappy in the office? And then I began to slowly empathise with this idea of the introversion of sacrifice. It's not just that I have to be where I don't want to be, it's that I have to act in a way where my personality is locked in a little cupboard and replaced with the personality of the company, with its dull, quasi-friendly, airplane food communication style. A little piece of my spirit in return for the means to go on existing. And when I thought about it like that, it did seem like quite a significant sacrifice. With all our amazing technology, even those among us who are privileged enough to work in well-paid jobs still feel dehumanised and machine-like. And it's in this spirit I want to return to corporate music, which I think of as the audio equivalent of the workspace hive mind. And it also seems to be bound by similar rules. It can't be too artistic or experimental, and it needs to keep things nice and sensible. In fact, if it was legitimately genuine or heartfelt, it would kind of be embarrassing to listen to in the company of your colleagues, because authentic, heartfelt expression doesn't sit well in an environment where emotional displays are frowned upon. So instead, internal workplace music tends to be an empty husk, only dealing with the most conventional and surface-level cliches while actively avoiding edginess or unpredictability. It resembles the environment it was created in. For example, let's take the music I wrote for the introduction to this video, which I based on something I'm sure you've all been subjected to a thousand times, the inspirational video. Let's begin with the harmony, where I've used one of the most unoriginal progressions in existence. This is your absolute go-to if you want to sound deep, in the shallowest possible way. And pay attention to the fact that this progression never changes once. This is the essential rule when writing corporate music. Avoid development at all costs. Now since our harmony is standing still, we need to give the illusion of development by using another classic trick, which is adding a new instrument every two bars. First you hear a bass drum, then the bass, then a repetitive melody which never threatens to destabilise the key. And then, with a big burst of drums and vocals, the music hits its peak. And because I wanted it to sound extra inspirational, I threw in some meaningless vocal ticks too, to make it sound sort of spiritual or something. The vocal tick I decided on was the phrase Boba Hui. So that's our peak, achieved through loudness rather than any attempt at musical development. Nothing happened. No story was told. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. He's just gonna sit on the wall. He's still there, still there. This is the continuing story of how Humpty sat on the wall. He's sitting on the wall. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. I go to bed, he's on the wall. The next day I have my breakfast and I look up and he's still there on the wall. He's still there. He's still there, still, still watching. Hey, Tantacruel, enjoy your day at the office. Okay, uh, thanks, Humpty. Um, see you later. You will see me later. I bet you'll never guess what I'll be doing. Um, are, are you going to be sitting on that wall? The next type of corporate music I want to talk about is in such high demand it has to be produced in industrial quantities. I call it nothing music. Nothing music comes into play when a business doesn't want to communicate any type of emotion. They just need something that sounds like music in their videos because the alternative is silence. And you come across this in more uncontroversial industries like accounting or tech support. Again, I'm going to create my own pastiche of this style, which primarily takes its inspiration from the kings of nothing music and fellow Irish compatriots, you too. And specifically, we're going to be drawing from the granddaddy of genericism, The Edge. Hallowed be his name with that incredibly lame guitar delay effect he's known for. A great technique for nothing music is to open with an ostinato phrase that repeats right until the end. This one noodles away uninterestingly in the key of D, until joined by some piano chords. First we have D, then we have G, followed by C, followed by a cowardly retreat back to D. 
and then for the coup de gras, this inane melody. And with that, we've achieved near complete harmonic inertia. This exact process can be followed to write nothing music in no time. And to recap, let's look at a different example I put together in about 20 minutes. First you have the ostinato. Then you add two or three chord changes. In this case, I'm just moving the root note of the chord in the bass. Then you add a pestilential melody, which keeps restating the same phrase with only minor differences. There we go. Vintage nothing music. So, one of the unfortunate consequences of businesses creating music for internal advertising is that corporate hacks get so used to it, it's not long before it begins to affect how they communicate with their customers. And nowhere is this more evident than in the world of tech. We need tech that helps people understand each other. That understands my business. Dude. The purpose of this kind of music is to help sell the idea that the product being sold is the culmination of some kind of profound altruistic endeavor aimed at the betterment of humanity. The inspirational music written for this style of advert usually requires a decent orchestral sampler because you can believe you're going to be hearing a lot of string sections playing spiccato. Then you begin to build the collaboration that will help you go on that voyage. And when they're not going the we're making the world a better place route, then uh, they instead go for the isn't life just awesome route. This is possibly the most irritating of all and you can expect to hear one of two different sounds. The first is whistling. Hey, have you got a really trivial inconvenience? Well, here at we've designed a ludicrously expensive gadget to help until it breaks or we design something even more expensive. Let's make the world a brighter place by wasting our disposable income. Aside from that, the most common and egregious isn't life just awesome instrument of them all is the ukulele. Now, since I don't have one of these to hand, I asked fellow YouTuber David Bruce to record himself strumming the lamest progression he could think of on his one. Here's what he gave me. Perfect. And from that, we get this. Life is just so great, it's so good. Uh, things are amazing and we can all get together and we can all be together and, and be one. And yeah, we can all do lots of stuff. Uh, the great, um, We love everyone, Li life is great. Uh, love, love life, life, uh, being together and uh, the end, uh, buy my stuff please. Now, although most inspirational ads try to be vague about the social good their product will bring about, usually sticking to phrases like me, you, everywhere, inspire, yada yada, others go a bit further by pretending to support an actual cause, like Audi, whose advert seen here pretends to care about equal pay for women. Do I tell her that her grandpa's worth more than her grandma? This advert landed them in hot water after it was pointed out that their entire executive team were men. Oh dear. And after taking a deeper look, I discovered that it was created by a company called uh, Cause Marketing. Th th there are companies you can hire to help you pretend you care about causes? How can these people survive without punching themselves in the face? So, to finish up, let's look at the most outrageously cynical marketing campaigns of all. Those by oil companies pretending to care about the environment. An issue this sensitive requires some big guns. For this, you'll need monorhythmic piano chords. Every year, the destruction of the Amazon rainforest intensifies. This makes us sad. Here at Shell, we are sad. And that's what corporate music is. Pretending. Pretending to be something a human would write in order to communicate an actual emotion. Pretending to be anything other than a creative stillbirth, the product of a thousand unimaginative decisions. And no matter how hard it tries, it just can't help but reflect the banality and inauthenticity of the corporation that commissioned it. And that, I suppose, is the one emotional insight it's capable of providing. It is a pretty accurate portrayal of what corporate life is really like. Dull, hackneyed, and completely lacking in substance. 
Here's some monster truck music. If you like my diatribe, subscribe!